we've been going through this, this series in 1 Peter and talking about how much of this letter is about hope and the hope that he wants to have in the early Christian church who was suffering great persecution at the hands of Rome and how he encouraged them to hold on to the hope despite the sufferings that they were in. And this reading that we heard, there's so much there. And some of it, I would love to sit at the, at, at the feet of, of a theologian and a pastor like Pastor Ted and, and talk about uh, uh, how the flood symbolizes our baptism or talk about what the church calls the harrowing of hell where we say in our, in our creed that, that Jesus descended into hell and Peter tells us that he proclaimed to the prisoners. I can only begin to understand what that may mean. So we're not, we're not even going to touch that. That's above my pay grade. <laughs> I noticed that the last few times that I've been preaching, I, I can tend to be uh, kind of expository, where I'll, I'll take our entire text and I'll try and knock my way through the entire thing and, and talk about things that I find. But there's so much here that there's not time. But what really struck me in this series about living hope is that verse right in the center. And I want to take our time focusing almost primarily on that. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. I think there's enough just in those few phrases to keep us busy for a few moments. And as well, I'm not necessarily, I'm not, I'm not studied in, in, uh, in biblical languages. There's a great website called Blue Letter Bible that will show you what the original language words were, and then you can click on that word and get the definition of that word, and see where that word has been used in other verses in the Bible. So I'm trespassing a little bit outside of my area of expertise, and I pray that, that I don't misguide us. But I found some very, very interesting things as I, as I broke these phrases up. So we're going to take them bit by bit. So let's start with always be prepared. First off, the word always, perpetually, incessantly, at any time and every time. So when you hear that word always, does that give you any impression that there's time to take a break? No, no. Always means always. And then the phrase, be prepared. This is the exact same language that Jesus used in his parables about the wedding feast, about, about those who knew that the bridegroom was coming and those who went and prepared themselves for the bridegroom to, to arrive and those who weren't ready and those who were let into the wedding feast, and those who were kept out. Jesus said, be prepared. And when I, when I hear that phrase, always be prepared, it brings to mind the Boy Scouts. Now, I never was a Boy Scout. You could argue that I am not ever prepared. Um, my, my dad was a sailor, and we had a boat growing up, so I know how to tie a couple knots, but I've probably forgotten most of them. But as I looked up some of the history of, of the Boy Scouts' motto of always being prepared, this one definition says this, that, that a Boy Scout should always be in a state of readiness in mind and body to do your duty. You've done the training, you've earned your badges, and so now your head and your hands and your heart are always prepared. But as some of the Boy Scouts that I've known and fathers who help out with Boy Scouts, this isn't you learn it and you're done and you move on. But it's a constant training. It's a constant moving up the ranks. So you're constantly relearning those skills so they become more and more ingrained into you. And the more that you do them, the more prepared you are to use those skills when the need arises. Or in pro professional development, Christine is a doctor. And every year she has to get so many CMEs, continuing medical education, is that right? Um, <laughs> going to conferences and, and journals and whatnot, get you these CMEs that say, yeah, you went to medical school and we appreciate that, but we see that you're continuing your education so you can keep abreast of, of the latest trends and, and, and what's going on. You can't just do it once and forget it, but you need to constantly be immersed. That's what keeps you sharp. That's what keeps you fresh. That's what keeps you on top of things. But that's what helps you to be always prepared. And if you're like me, who kind of has this, this, this bent between perfectionism and procrastination, um, always be prepared can very quickly devolve into, I will never be ready. I will never have all the data that I need. I will never know it all. I will never have all the pieces of the puzzle put in place. I haven't earned all my badges yet. I won't know what to say when the need arises. 
And so that paralyzes us, and we think that we will never be prepared. But being prepared is about knowing whose you are and who you are in Christ. It's knowing that our baptism has saved us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in that baptism, we receive the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that rose Jesus from the grave. And that same Holy Spirit that Paul tells us, we have the power in prayer. That same Holy Spirit is in you. Being prepared doesn't mean that we need to have all of the answers. It means being ready to give your testimony, your witness. This is what Jesus has done for me. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. Give an answer, the Greek word apologia. Best definition is a verbal defense, a reasoned statement or argument. This isn't an argument like one of us is going to win and one of us is going to lose. One of us is going down and one of us is going to remain standing. In Scripture, apologia is most used in, in, in terms of, of talking about defending the gospel, about defending against accusations. I think reasoned statement is the best way to understand it. And let me be clear, giving a defense is the opposite of being offensive. If you find yourself beginning, beginning conversations with, no offense, but, because what's going to follow after that is probably going to be offensive. This isn't about winning the argument. This isn't about, about, about playing offense and getting the goal. This isn't about getting one past them so that you can win. Now, granted, if we take that anal analogy too far, playing defense is not letting them get a goal because we don't want them to win against us. So that's why I think the idea of, of a reasoned statement sums it up very well. Give an answer to everyone, each, every, any, all, individually or collectively. Every single person who asks. And I love this. The, the, the way that, that, that the word that we translate asks, other definitions are beg, call for, crave, desire. Note the positive inference in those meanings. It's not demanding, it's not forceful, it's not coercive. It says that they really want to know. And this, this positive outcome of them really wanting to know, of craving to know, it's the outcome of living winsomely, of living humbly, of living non-offensively. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. The reason. Wow. The word that is translated reason here is logos. And that's the same word that John uses in the beginning of his gospel. And the word, the logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. The number of definitions for logos is huge. And the best that I could find that, that becomes translated as we hear this morning as reason, a matter under discussion a thing spoken of, an affair, a matter in dispute, a case, a suit at law, which goes along with the defense, an account, a reckoning, a score, an answer or explanation in reference to a judgment. And I think what, what best sums it up is a reason, a cause, or a ground. Now, we get, in, in the English language, we get our words from so many different languages, from German, from Latin, and yes, from Greek. And so that word logos, we translate, you know, we, we create the word logic. But what's important, though, is that we don't take our understanding of logic now and put it back into the understanding of logos because we'll get off track, and we're going to see that in a little bit. So while, while other times it's, it's translated word, here the best way is a reason. And then the hope, the expectation of good, and especially in a Christian context, joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. I know I've talked about this some in the past, but I think that, that in our world today, we've cheapened the word hope. That even as Christians, out in the world, <clears throat> we can use hope to either, to either mean that, that, that we've put our hope in the wrong things, or we can show that we've actually lost our hope. If you say to me, can you come to my party? And I'll say, I hope so. 
And all that really means is, if I don't have something better going on, I hope to be there. Or I hope I get the job. Or I hope I get into that school. Or I hope Jim Harbaugh you know, turns the football program at U of M around next year. But then what if he doesn't? And what if you don't? And what if you can't? And what happens to that hope? That hope becomes dashed. Or worse yet, we lose hope. When we look around at the world around us, it's so easy for us, even Christians, to say, this place is going to hell in a handbasket. And where is the hope in that? But what's, what's being said here is everyone is asking you to give a reason for the hope that you have in the midst of the struggles, in the midst of the struggles of this life, in the midst of adversity, defend why you are so hopeful. They're not asking you, defend yourself on why you're such a jerk on Facebook. They're not asking you, defend yourself against why you take this particular stance on this particular issue. They're not saying, defend yourself against why you think I'm such a bad person because I have this particular viewpoint. But instead, they're asking you, why do you have such a hope when everything around us seems so awful? Why can we have hope when police officers kill civilians unprovoked? Why can we continue to have hope when people that are protesting then turn to rioting? Why can we have hope when ISIS beheads Christians or throws them overboard to die? I don't know if you remember, about a year ago, there was a hashtag that was going around, bring our girls back home, where 200 girls in Nigeria were kidnapped by Boko Haram. And just this week, flying under the radar in the midst of everything else that we have going on in our world, Nigeria has reclaimed over 300 of these girls and brought them back home. There's a reason to have hope. But then as we take this word hope and we dig through the rest of Scripture, here's some other things that I love. Paul says to the Romans in Romans chapter 4, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. It looked dire for Abraham. He was old, his wife was barren, but God had promised him he was going to be the son, he was going to have a son and be the father of a great nation. Everything seemed hopeless for Abraham, but against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. In Acts 23, Paul says, I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And then as we know that Peter is writing to to a group of Christians who are being persecuted by the Roman government. Here Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 5, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given us. That's hope. For as we hear Peter write in our reading today, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Jesus, who while we often don't feel always prepared, Jesus was always prepared from the very beginning of time. He suffered for us to bring us to God. He not only had hope, he is the embodiment of hope. He is the logos he is the reason for the hope that we have. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. I first want to look at, at the word respect, because this is an interesting one. The word that is translated respect is phobos, which if we take it to our root words over here, Phobia, fear, terror, dread. I have a fear of heights. Christine's got a fear of snakes. Some people have arachnophobia, a fear of spiders. But do this with gentleness and phobia? This is why we need to be careful of taking how we use these root words and putting them back. Because another way that phobos is translated and the way it's being translated here, reverence for one's husband. Now, I thought about this a little bit this morning. I can have a, a, a phobia of heights, but I can still encounter heights, and I'm going to respect the heights. 
I'm going to walk around on my roof cleaning out the gutters a little bit differently than the way I walk around when I'm on the ground. I wouldn't condone this, but there are people that keep snakes as pets. If you have a snake as pet and you want me to meet your pet snake, I may have a phobia of that snake, but I'm going to treat that snake with phobos, with respect, a little bit differently than I treat my declawed cat. <laughs> we can have a phobia and we can have respect. Similar but different things. But then Ephesians 5, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That, like that reverence for one's husband. And then the word for gentleness. Mildness of disposition, gentleness of spirit, of meekness. I love this. In 1 Corinthians uh, 4, verse 21, Paul says, What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline? Or shall I come in love with a gentle spirit? Which one would you choose, given the choice? James chapter 3, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. In Colossians 3, we're encouraged. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And then the beautiful words from Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. If we argue, if, if we give a defense for the reason of the hope within us, and we do it in a prideful, offensive, combative way, they can retort against us and say, see, all you Christians are alike. They're not, they're, if we behave in that way, they're not going to want to ask us why we have a hope. Instead, they're going to turn away. But if we have the fruit of the Spirit evidence in us, they're going to ask. This godly, winsome gentleness of spirit can only be lived by the power of the Holy Spirit who bears his fruit in us. And if you come here today feeling empty of that fruit, Come to the table and pray that he would fill you and grow that fruit in you again. Or maybe you've come today and you're not even hungry for that fruit. You don't even desire to see that fruit in your life. And come to the table and pray that he would make you hungry to produce his fruit instead of the fruit of the flesh. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. In our gospel reading this morning, we had the, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And through their conversation with Jesus, who they didn't know was Jesus, it seems that their hope was lost or perhaps just misplaced. The hope of the resurrection in Jesus' promises had not yet been realized to them. They say in Luke 24, verse 21, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. That hope is lost now because, because the evidence is to the contrary. Obviously, if he was the one to redeem Israel, he would not have been killed. But what they don't realize is their hope was too small. Yes, Jesus came to redeem Israel, and he came to redeem the Gentiles, and not only that, he came to defeat sin and death, and have victory over them forever. We had hoped, but our hope was dashed. We thought we were prepared, but we weren't really ready. And see, at first they didn't recognize Jesus, and neither did Mary when she thought he was the gardener, and neither did the other disciples when, when they were out fishing and this guy is giving them advice on where to throw their nets. But it wasn't until something else happened and there's many reasons on why they didn't recognize him at first. But one reason could possibly be because they didn't expect to see Jesus there. Through all of Jesus' promises, the disciples tended to not catch on to all the times he promised that he would rise again on the third day. And then Jesus, oh foolish ones, do you still not yet see, opens up all of scriptures to them. 
and shows them through the prophecies and the promises pointing to the suffering of the Messiah. And then when Jesus broke bread at supper, their eyes were opened. Did our hearts not burn? Peter writes this letter about 30-some years after the resurrection. Most of the people at that time who would have been reading it probably weren't around to see the, the, the first-hand accounts of Jesus before his ascension. He's an eyewitness. He was there, and he's giving them the encouragement because of his eyewitness. And here we are, some 2,000 years after the resurrection. I don't think we lose hope about the resurrection. I think, if anything, we can tend to lose hope that he's going to return soon. Because Jesus and his apostles afterwards and the, the, the writers of, of the New Testament kept on saying, he's coming soon, he's coming soon. And here we are 2,000 years later, do we go, is he really? What does soon really mean? Look at this place. We're going to hell in a handbasket. Where's the hope in that? But Peter encourages us today, hold on to the hope. Don't give it up. You all have come here today, so let him prepare you. Expect to find Jesus where he promised to be, in his word and in the sacrament. Be filled up and trained up in his word. Yes, on Sunday, but throughout all the rest of the week so that we are always prepared. Expect to find Jesus with us wherever we go. He promised before he ascended, lo, I am with you always. We have that logos, the reason for the hope within us. And then expect to find Jesus on mission, already on mission wherever we go. He commanded us to take that hope to a world that is struggling and take care of the least of these. And in so doing, we serve him. So take notice around you as you go. Who is around you in your life? What are their names? What are their stories? Where can you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, extend them some of the same grace that's been extended to you? To extend them some encouragement, some truly good news, some hope. When people ask why you have this hope in the midst of a struggling world, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to give your defense in a way that is gentle and respectful. Perhaps you could say something like this, I have hope in the midst of suffering because Jesus suffered for me and he suffered for you, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And because of that, I join him on his mission to care for the world he so loves. He is the hope that is within me. And you can have that hope within you as well. And so this morning, I want to leave you this, this beautiful benediction from, from Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.